Hi, everyone. We'll get started. Uh, this is Jason Key at SB Grid at Harvard Medical School. Thanks for joining today. We'll get started. Uh, today, it's a real pleasure to welcome Steve Luca. Steve is a professor at uh, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. He's going to he's the developer of Eman2, and he's going to tell us about some of the exciting new developments that uh, have come about in Eman2 recently. Um, so, Steve, are you there? Yep. Great. OK, great. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jason and Michelle for uh, uh, inviting me to give this little uh, uh, update to Eman2. Sorry about the telephone ringing there in the background. I'm going to ignore it. Um, so uh, the last time I gave one of these little uh, little uh, chats to SB Grid was uh, about two years ago, something like that, when uh, Eman was at uh, 2.12. Uh, so uh, things have changed a fair bit, so I'll go through some of those changes. I'll go through some of the, the uh, new features and new capabilities as, as well. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave the system check okay? Yep, looks good. We're all set. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, I'll just quickly summarize this. I'm going to assume that probably most of the people listening to this are at least basically familiar with cryoEM and single particle analysis. Um, but uh, just to sort of set the set the tone of what we're going to be talking about, you know, single particle analysis, we take these fields of uh, a view of uh, isolated single particles uh, embedded in thin vitreous ice. Uh, we then uh, locate the particles. Uh, we can then do 2D analysis uh, to generate these 2D class averages, and that'll give us some idea of the sort of variability present uh, in the uh, in, in the population of particles and, and show us what some of the different views of the particles look like and that sort of thing. We can then extend this sort of 2D analysis into a dynamics analysis, where we take individual class averages. Of course, this is a variety of different uh, molecules, not just the, uh, the, the uh, MMCPN that I was showing in the previous slide. Uh, but we can do some dynamics analysis, which, which lets us see what sort of uh, structural variability may be going on in, in the particles in specific orientations. Uh, I realize the animations probably aren't going to be coming through smoothly or full speed, but it, you should still be able to get the gist of uh, most of what I'm showing here. Uh, then, of course, the last step is, is uh, producing 3D reconstructions. Uh, there's an iterative process for doing this. This slide is as old as the original EMAN, so it's almost uh, sort of 20 years old now. Uh, uh, the basic process hasn't really changed in all that time, but a lot of this, the subtle details have, have changed, and that's, that's what one of the things that has allowed us to uh, improve speed and, and resolution of final structures. And then eventually, of course, we expect to produce one of these high-resolution structures, which which nowadays can extend past two angstrom resolution in, uh, in exceptionally favorable situations, uh, but achieving around three angstrom resolution is, is not an unreasonable goal. Now, the other major topic uh, that I'll be talking about today is uh, subtomogram averaging. So I'll assume that you pro probably also know at least a little bit about, uh, about uh, tomography. The basic idea is you can take either a field of single particles, like, uh, like we were just looking at for single particle analysis, uh, or you can take uh, a cell or a section of a cell and put it on the grid and then image it. Uh, unlike in the single particle analysis case where we just take, take a single untilted image of, of the specimen at, at uh, as high a dose as we can tolerate, uh, with subtomogram averaging, we tilt the specimen in the beam and we collect images at all of the different tilts. And then at the end, we combine those tilted images to produce a, a tomogram, a, a tomograph, a reconstruction of the, the material that we were looking at. Uh, this process has the advantage of giving us a three-dimensional structure of a single unique field of particles, but has the disadvantage that we have to take the dose that's available to us without producing radiation damage and fractionate it among all of these different tilts, which means that uh, the, the, the two-dimensional uh, resolution is not nearly as good. The images are much noisier uh, overall, uh, but we get three-dimensional information. So this is just an example of a tomogram of an entire cell. This is a small cell. It's a cyanobacteria. It's responsible for fixing uh, much of the, uh, the carbon on Earth, uh, not necessarily the specific species, but cyanobacteria in general. Uh, so the cell is less than a micron in size. Uh, this particular cell is being in the process of being infected with phages. Uh, phages are basically viruses for, for, that infect bacteria. Uh, and the goal of the study was, of course, to, uh, to look and see how the phages infected the cells and how the infection progressed and that sort of thing. So what we were just seeing there, sticking out the side, these little black dots that you see in there are ribosomes. Uh, the things sticking out of the side of the particle here, these are phage, part these are phage particles outside the, uh, the cell. 
then there are phages we can see inside the cell. So the next step in this process is to annotate what we actually have. So here we can annotate various cellular features. Um, so some of these large objects in here, these are actually carboxysomes, not virus capsids or not phage capsids. Uh, then eventually, yeah, here we'll, it will uh, annotate the infecting phages. Uh, and we can actually see baby phages inside the cell as well that have been produced by the cell itself after uh, the cell has been infected. Uh, over here, for example, you can also see ribosomes leaking out of the side of the, of the cell. Uh, all sorts of really interesting things we can see going on. And one of the goals of this sort of, uh, of, of cryo-EM analysis, cryo-ET analysis, uh, is to extract particles from situations like this and drew to do true in situ structural biology. Uh, not to rely on having purified the molecule in question out of the cell and, and mix together maybe specific molecules that are believed to interact, but actually observe what's happening inside the cell. Now, if we extract one of those subtomograms, one of those particles from inside the cell, so this is a phage that I've extracted from the cell, uh, if you look at it in the XY plane, that's the plane of the untilted uh, image uh, in the microscope, uh, you can actually see the particle fairly clearly. If we look at the Fourier transform of the particle, we can see the structural information out ex extending out to the edge of Fourier space, meaning there's some high resolution information present there. Looks okay. Now, if we look in the orthogonal directions, if we look in the direction where, where we're uh, uh, perpendicular to, to that, uh, that zero tilted plane, uh, you can see this effect here. This is known as the missing wedge. And this is due to the geometry of the specimen in the microscope. We can't tilt this flat specimen all the way up to 90 degrees, or we'd be just looking straight through the edge of the grid. We wouldn't see anything. So we can typically only tilt up to about 50 to 60 degrees in the microscope. So that means in this orthogonal view, we have a lot of missing information. Uh, and if we look at the other orthogonal view, we can actually see the information is even worse. And this is why very often when you see tomograms presented, you see them presented in a slice-wise uh, direction going up and down in the XY plane, uh, because that's the direction where we have sort of the best information content. Now, when we do single particle analysis, this is not tomography, this is back to the original single particle analysis technique. The idea is each of these particles contributes a slice in Fourier space. So when you take a whole bunch of these particles in random orientations and put them together, we can gradually fill in the information in the Fourier volume. In tomography, each individual particle has information spanning this sort of minus 60 to plus 60 degree tilt, and there's just this missing wedge. But again, as I said before, the particles are much noisier because of the, the dose limitations inherent in the data. But nonetheless, this means that we can get complete information about, all, uh, about the full three-dimensional structure with far fewer particles. So if we just take two particles, for example, you can see we can already fill in a lot of that missing wedge. We take uh, just a dozen particles, we can get fairly complete structures. Uh, so we have complete directional information, but the, the resolution and the quality of the reconstruction is still going to be worse, generally speaking. So again, here's the cyanobacteria. If we box out all of the different sorts of phage particles that we see in here in different stages, we can then subclassify those particles and average them together, and we can get these very nice reconstructions. You can see we found five different types of phage particles that were present in the cell, including a, a couple of states which we hadn't previously observed. This also allows us to say something about the time course of the infection process and that sort of thing. So this was just a really quick example explaining uh, the context of, of the sort of in situ structural biology that we're, we're getting into now. Uh, so, uh, EMAN 2.2, what has changed? So this is just going to be sort of a quick summary of the major changes, and then I'm going to spend most of the rest of my talk talking about a couple of very specific features related to using deep learning techniques uh, in cryo-EM analysis. Uh, so for subtomogram averaging and tomography in EMAN 2.2, uh, we have a whole new subtomogram averaging pipeline. Uh, the 3D alignment algorithm that we're using now is up to 20 times faster than the one that we had before, which was already quite fast. If you look at some of the other subtomogram alignment and averaging suites that are out there, uh, if you tried to do 300 cubed particles, uh, it could easily take you, you know, 20 minutes or 15, 20 minutes to align just one pair of particles. So we've managed to do uh, process a data set of uh, over 6,000 particles now just using a single workstation without doing anything on the GPU in under a day using the, this new alignment algorithm. Uh, additionally, the new uh, alignment algorithm automatically compensates for uh, the, this the missing wedge artifact. Uh, if you look at most of the software out there for doing subtomogram averaging, you have to 
go through a bunch of steps to keep track of where the missing, missing wedge is so it can be properly dealt with when you're doing these alignments. Uh, so that's done completely automatically now. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this deep learning based classification a little bit later, um, and also the neural network segmentation a little bit later. Now, on the single particle analysis, the, the first technique I talked about, there have been lots and lots of improvements over the last couple of years. Uh, we have a new strategy for identifying bad particles. Uh, this is actually quite robust. If you, if you take the good particles and you take the bad particles and you refine the good ones and you refine the bad ones, you can actually demonstrate that the bad particles really aren't producing very good structures and the good particles, uh, uh, you, can produce, you can produce as good a, part, a structure or better uh, using the good particles than you could when the bad particles uh, were included. Um, and again, this is a, an automated strategy. This doesn't in, involve separating the data into five or six different groups and saying, oh, that's a bad reconstruction, that's a bad reconstruction. It's less arbitrary. It's, it's all uh, numerically driven. Um, we have uh, new techniques for uh, determining local resolution and filtering locally in, in the maps. This allows you to take portions of the map which are moving a lot uh, and, and low pass filter them appropriately. Uh, and it also downplays the importance of those moving domains in the alignments of the structures. So it means you can actually get better resolutions in the domains that aren't moving uh, by incorporating this local filter into your, uh, into your process. Uh, we have a new stochastic gradient descent initial model generator. I still term it as experimental, but it works reasonably well. Uh, we have some new methods for doing conformational and compositional uh, heterogeneity analysis. Uh, we published a paper uh, la last year, a uh, review style paper, uh, talking about some of those different methods. There are seven or eight of them, so, so there, there's a lot of different uh, things to choose from depending on your circumstances. Uh, we now have a strategy for doing automatic phase plate CTF correction for people who are now collecting data on uh, both Zernike uh, and uh, the FEI uh, phase plates. Uh, we have a whole new E2 Boxer program. This has been one of the complaints for five or six years. There were a bunch of bugs in the particle picking program. We have a new one, uh, and the new particle picker also supports neural networks. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Uh, we have an automatic magnification and isotropy correction tool, which will deal with this issue on a lot of FEI microscopes where the magnification isn't the same in one direction as it is in the orthogonal direction. Uh, so you can automatically measure and correct for that without having to collect any special calibration data. Uh, and we've made some new improvements, and this is actually very recent. It's after EMAN 2.2. It's in recent snapshot versions. Uh, we've made some new improvements to both 2D and 3D refinement strategies, which has literally allowed for about a 15 times uh, faster uh, you know, speed up in, in, in processing. And I'll, I'll show that very briefly later on as well. So uh, just to take a quick look at uh, some of these improvements. So about two years ago, a little less than two years ago, there was this uh, CryoEM map challenge uh, where seven uh, standardized data sets were made available uh, via the, the Empire Raw Data Archive uh, at, at, at in, the, in the UK. Um, so there were seven different uh, raw data sets that were provided and people were challenged to reconstruct them with their favorite software. Uh, of course, we participated in, in this challenge on, on a lot of different structures. Uh, this, was, uh, this particular data set was the original TRIP V1, oops, the original TRIP V1 uh, uh, ion channel that, uh, uh, that Yifan published in uh, 2013. There was, of course, a higher resolution structure that was published later, but this was using the original data set. Uh, on the right, you can see the reconstruction uh, that was done with Reliant. On the left, you can see the reconstruction that was done with EMAN2 two years ago. So this was done with EMAN2.1. You can see they're quite comparable and, uh, and uh, you know, the level of detail and stuff is, 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 is basically the same. Uh, the resolution tube is basically the same as well. Uh, here is just a section of that TRIP V1 structure that we submitted to the challenge. Uh, and I'm just going to show you now, switch to what we get in that same section uh, using EMAN 2.2, uh, even if the resolution as measured by FSC hasn't changed all that much, I mean, it's a very slight improvement, uh, you can see that the quality of the side chains uh, has gotten pretty noticeably better. So there's before, there's after. Um, so improvements that are occurring in the high resolution regime uh, are becoming more and more subtle. Uh, the software is beginning to approach the limits of what the data can, can, can achieve. Uh, so improvements that we're seeing now are related to uh, 
uh, automation and perform and you know speed of the, of the refinement algorithms and that sort of thing with much more subtle changes to to overall resolution and, and features uh, here's an example of a 2d classification on the same particles uh, oh, this sorry not the same particles this is beta galactosidase uh, uh, so this is an example of 70,000 particles uh, the particles are 480, 480 by 480 pixels, so they're fairly large particles because they were done at like 0.6 angstroms per pixel. Uh, and these two, these class averages, we've made 256 classes, and it took eight minutes on a single workstation without using the GPU, using the new algorithm that I alluded to uh, uh, a couple of slides back. Uh, using the previous approach, it would took it took about two to three hours to achieve the same result. Um, uh, this is just to show that uh, the class averages that uh, are sh uh, that are shown there are actually very detailed. You can see a lot of this, the secondary structure and stuff beginning to emerge in, in these class averages. So these aren't lower quality class averages or anything like that. And a 3D refinement of the beta galactosidase uh, using this this same 70,000 particle data set, uh, I can get it to five angstrom resolutions using four in, in 45 minutes on the same single workstation. Uh, and can get it to the three and a half angstrom resolution, which is is the best you can achieve with this data set in about three hours. Again, on the workstation. So the the speed up is pretty dramatic, and this is a this is a completely new algorithm. Okay, uh, the rest of the talk I'm going to mostly focus on uh, some of these deep learning and neural network uh, techniques that we've been uh, developing over the last uh, couple of years in the lab. Uh, most of this development work uh, was done by Muyuan Chen, who is a, a graduate student in my lab. Uh, he just graduated, is now, now a postdoc for, for a brief time before he uh, goes off and, and finds something else to do. Um, uh, James uh, Michael Bell uh, also participated in, in, in some of this work as well, uh, but Muyuan was really the, uh, the driver. Uh, basically, uh, Mu Yuan went, went over to Rice and he took this class in deep learning and he came back and said, I want to apply deep learning to, uh, to, to CryoM. What, what can we do with it? Uh, and then we brainstormed a little bit. And, and uh, you know, deep learning is, a, is very good uh, at approaching problems which are more qualitative than quantitative. Uh, I mean, it can do quantitative analysis but uh, it's, it's good for sort of gray areas and, and that sort of thing. So, so the immediate thing that sprang to mind was this problem of uh, doing segmentation on tomograms. Okay, so let's just start out with a little background on, on deep learning and, and neural networks in general. Because uh, I find there's actually, people know that deep learning relates to neural networks, but they very often don't uh, understand some of the subtle changes that have, have really caused it to take off again in recent years. So this is uh, uh, just a standard picture of a feed-forward neural network. Uh, you could have seen a picture like this in, back in the 70s when the idea of neural networks first uh, first came up. Uh, the basic idea is we have a set of neurons, in this case eight neurons. Each neuron holds a single value, a single floating point number, basically. Uh, each of these neurons is then connected to neurons in subsequent layers. Uh, this is a network which is, has full connectivity, so every neuron here is, is connected to every neuron in the second layer. Now, if we look at that, if we look at these connections, uh, each of these connections has a weight associated with this. And this is modeled after concepts in, in neurobiology. Basically, you, you have one neuron connecting to another neuron via the dendrite axon connection, uh, and then there's some connection weight associated with that connection. In so basically, if we just look at those weights, uh, if we have all of the connections from here to here, we could represent that as an eight by eight matrix. So we go from eight neurons to eight neurons. So every neuron is connected to every other. So we have, a, we have basically a matrix of 64 weights. Uh, then if we have that layer connected to another layer with eight neurons, then there's another matrix with 64 weights. If we then go to four neurons in the next layer, then we have 32 weights, eight by four. Now, if you look at this, you say, well, I know a little linear algebra. And basically, if all you're doing is taking the values here and multiplying them by this, this matrix here, I could just take these matrices and multiply them together and collapse my whole network down to just a single layer. Uh, so then you just have a single weight matrix just by doing matrix multiplication. Um, that's not the case. And the reason that's not the case is because there's also an activation function. So the outputs of each of these neurons uh, passes through this nonlinear function. Now, if you look at the original neural networks back in the, in the 70s, 
these non uh, these these nonlinear functions were modeled after what happened in the brain. You had these sort of complex sigmoidal shapes, uh, which were often uh, hyperbolic arc tangents or something like that. Uh, so it was sort of flat, and then it curved up, and then it was sort of flat up here again. Um, so one of the large advances that was made uh, uh, back in 2006 was that if you just include a very simple nonlinearity, in this case it's zero until you would have a threshold value, and then it's linear after that point, so-called ReLU function. Uh, if you use this very simple nonlinearity, you can actually represent arbitrary nonlinearity uh, as long as you make your neural network deep enough. And the fact that we have this nonlinearity means that that matrix multiplication idea uh, goes uh, goes out the door. You, you can no longer do that because now it's no longer a linear system of equations and not it's a nonlinear system of equations. Okay, so let's consider this. Let's say we wanted to use this neural network structure to do image processing. So I want to start with just a simple 100 by 100 pixel image. That means that I would take 10,000 neurons, basically one neuron for each pixel, just to represent the image. And if I wanted to have a fully connected layer from first layer to the, you know, the second layer, each with 10,000 neurons in it, that would mean I'd need 10 to the eighth weights. So it would be a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix to represent that. And that would be each layer. If I had an even bigger image, like 256 by 256, you can see that very rapidly the number of weights just becomes absurdly large. Uh, and you wouldn't be able to profitably do anything with that. Uh, the other issue is that it's not very efficient. So if I have my 100 by 100 pixel image, <clears throat> let's say I have some object, some shape that I'm trying to recognize in one corner of the image. Um, I have to train all of those connections related to that corner of the image to represent whatever that feature that I'm trying to identify or, or trying to analyze is. If I have the same feature located in a different part of the image, then I have to have a similar set of weights trained in the, another part of the network to represent that particular feature in a different part of the image. It's a very inefficient way of doing it. Okay, so the concept of deep learning, which originated back in 2006, has evolved to include many different sort of extended concepts. Uh, one of the concepts is, is the deep networks, and I sort of alluded to that in a pre previous slide, which is the networks that we have now uh, have a very simple nonlinearity. Uh, but the networks have many, many, many layers, which allows the networks to encompass an arbitrary amount of nonlinearity and represent arbitrarily nonlinear functions. Uh, the idea that made these deep networks possible was a proof which showed that you could rapidly train networks that had these simple nonlinearities using the standard back, back propagation techniques that had been developed uh, earlier on. And that you could accurately train these networks in, in that fashion, even if they became very deep. Um, the next concept, which I'm going to be talking about more in the next couple slides, is convolutional networks. We also have concepts of modules, which are like mini networks embedded within larger networks, which do specific purposes. Uh, Autoencoders, which I'll, I'll also mention briefly later. Uh, the recursive neural networks. The networks I showed you before were feed-forward networks, meaning you put something in the input and then something comes out the output, but you can actually have networks where the outputs connect back to the inputs, much more like the, uh, the, the brain operates, and then you have to look for steady-state behavior and all sorts of things. So th there are all of these different concepts in deep learning. So when someone says deep learning, it's not a specific thing. It's, it's a, uh, a group of, of uh, related techniques. It's actually a whole field in and of itself. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about convolutional neural networks because they really solve the problem that we have when we're trying to do image processing. Uh, so in the, con in the concept of a convolutional neural network, we still have neurons, but now instead of the neurons representing individual values, an individual neuron contains an entire image. Okay, so my input to this neural network is an entire image, and then each neuron contains another image. Now, how do we go from this image to this image? It's not a simple multiplication pro process like it was in the previous network. This is where the name convolutional comes in. We actually take the input image and we convolve it with what's called a, the convolution kernel. Uh, this is basically, if you don't know a lot of math, this is, this is basically a filtration process where this little 15 by 15 pixel image defines the type of filtration that's being performed. If I wanted to perform a low-pass filter, for example, uh, then I would have a you know, blurring filter, then I would just have a Gaussian present in here, a Gaussian blob, basically. 
Uh, but these filters can be arbitrarily complex. They could be low-pass filters, high-pass filters, or they can have complicated structure. So each of these connections that we're showing here has one of these 15 by 15 kernels associated with it. And since it's a convolution operation, that means that the same operation is basically being performed for every pixel in the image. So this gives us translational invariance. So when we train the neural network, what we're training is these kernels, the values of these kernels, uh, and uh, then there's also the associated nonlinearity. There's, there's a shift and a... Uh, 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 and then this, you know, this relu function basically that comes into play as well. So there's a scaling and a shift also. But the convolution kernel is the, is the key to this process. So the network that we're using here is actually very simple. One of the problems with deep networks is the structure of the network becomes important and the networks become somewhat difficult to train. You have to have a, a computer scientist to sort of guide the process to train a network to, 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 to achieve the desired result. So some of the networks that you that you use all the time, for example, the voice recognition networks that are used by Google and Apple when you when you talk to the, the digital voice assistants and stuff like that, that's all done using deep learning techniques. Those are pre-trained networks which use very deep networks which do a very good job at voice recognition. In the case of tomogram analysis or cryoEM, it's impossible at this point in time to come up with a single network which can annotate every feature that's present simply because we don't understand everything about all the possible features that we might encounter, uh, and because the texture that's present in different tomograms tends to be fairly different because of diff differences in focus, differences in buffer conditions, difference in cell types, there's all sorts of things that change. So it's very difficult to come up with a single network which will do everything. So our concept here, instead of trying to come up with a really complicated network that does everything, we have a very simple network which is easy to train, and we have the users training the networks themselves. So the idea is that we're going to have this shallow network making it easy to train and allowing us to have a fixed network structure. We don't have to change the structure at all. However, each of these trained networks is going to have a very limited scope of, of applicability. Basically, each of these trained networks is going to represent a single feature as annotated by a single annotator. Okay, so we have one network equals one feature, one annotator means it's easily trained with a relatively small number of examples, and the goal here is basically to mimic a human annotator. So the gold standard right now in annotating cellular tomograms is humans. Uh, the earlier tomogram that I showed you uh, takes a, a, a good annotator roughly uh, three or four days of full-time work to annotate. Basically, you have to go through the tomogram slice by slice and manually draw each feature that you're trying to uh, that, that you're trying to identify uh, within the tomogram. Um, so basically every voxel in this entire you know 4k by 4k by 1k tomogram you're trying to annotate. Uh, so that's that the, the, there is no rigorous oh am I right am I wrong about this sort of process it's very difficult to establish a ground truth uh, but humans know what they're looking for and they can find it pretty effectively. So the goal here is to train a network which will mimic that human behavior. Once we have trained a network, then for a particular feature, we can then move on and train a network for another feature, and then train a network for another feature, and then train for a network for another feature, and then we take the whole set of networks, apply them to the same tomogram, and then we apply this competitive merging process, where each of these networks basically has a probability that each voxel is a member of this particular class. Uh, and then whichever one has the strongest probability wins, and you wind up with an annotation then of the entire tomogram. But you get added power by training more and more networks with more and more features. So here's just an overview of the, the whole process. So here's a tomogram. This is of a PC12 cell. Uh, what you're seeing, the outside circle that you see on the outside there, that isn't the edge of the cell. That's the edge of the carbon hole that the cell is sitting on. We're looking just through the middle of a neurite of a particular section. These things going across here are microtubules. So we manually identify a little 64 by 64 tile containing microtubules, and then we annotate it by hand. Okay, we say this is a microtubule, this is a microtubule. Then we then repeat the process for you know, 10 or 15 different examples, and then we find a few other areas of the tomogram that don't contain any microtubules, and we don't annotate those at all. So what we're doing is we're telling the network that these are microtubules, these pixels contain microtubules, and these pixels do not contain microtubules, and then we're getting the network to discriminate between those two possibilities. Once we've done that, 
we can get it to discriminate other things, for example, ribosomes, membranes, and other features using this competitive merging process. Just letting it finish out here. Okay, once we've done that, we can mask out density corresponding to different features from inside the tomogram. And then we can align and average them together and do the subtomogram averaging that I talked about a little bit earlier. Get there in a second. So here, we, for example, we can extract uh, a bunch of different microtubules. We align them and average them together and a bunch of ribosomes and align them and average them together. And then we can get the results. Okay, so let me just show you a couple of examples of, uh, of, of this process. So again, this is the PC12 cell. Um, there's a lot of microtubules, there's a lot of ribosomes, there's a lot of vesicles of various sorts. Uh, so we're looking through a little bit of the neurite of, uh, of one of these cells. Uh, here's the full annotation of the cell. Uh, if, in this case, we extract out the microtubules and we average a bunch of them together, uh, we can see we are able to uh, find the periodicity of the microtubules. Uh, and when we average them, we can actually see it looks like there's actually some sort of cargo or some sort of molecule. There's something in the center of the microtubules. This was actually also recently observed in Diane Nicastro's group. Uh, so there's, there's, you know, there's something definitely going on here inside the microtubules. Um, now I need to point out that all of these tomograms that I'm showing you, these example tomograms I'm showing you, were collected for sort of morphological purposes. They were collected for purposes of looking at the cell as a whole and seeing how things were arranged inside the cell. They weren't collected with subtomogram, high resolution subtomogram averaging in mind. So we're not going to get any high resolution results out of these tomograms. Most of these tomograms were collected with the sampling of something like five to seven angstroms per pixel, meaning the best resolution you could possibly hope to achieve would be something in the, in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 angstroms. Uh, and the best resolution you'll typically achieve if you're not targeting high resolution is more like 30 or 40 angstroms. So here's an example of a trypanosome. Uh, in this case, we boxed out ribosomes and averaged them together. So on the, uh, on the right here, you see the uh, subtomogram average from the extracted ribosomes. On the left, you can see a uh, ribosome, a similar ribosome from the MDB, which was just low pass filtered. And you can see that we get a, a very nice structure out. Um, yeah, I already, I already mentioned this earlier, uh, the automatic alignment and stuff like that, high speed alignment. Uh, here's another example. This is from a cultured mouse neuron. Again, this is just a neurite from the from the mouse neuron. Uh, in this case, we extracted out some uh, microtubules. We've got some actin filaments. Uh, we found some things that look sort of like chaperonins. Uh, we also uh, pulled out some ribosomes. Of course, we can annotate a lot more things if we can if we can figure out what some like objects are. Uh, but this is a human guided process. The human has to define what it is they want to look for inside the cell to train the networks to extract it. Uh, here, I think this, yeah, this is my last example. Uh, in this case, uh, we're looking at the cyanobacteria that I showed you before. Uh, and here, we're going to extract out a layer of the thylakoid membrane where the light harvesting, con con uh, light harvesting complexes exist. And you can see this uh, nice periodicity that's present in the light harvesting complexes. Don't look at the details of this too closely. I'm not, I'm not claiming that we actually resolved the connections between the different elements of the light harvesting complex accurately here. We didn't do a careful job of the averaging. This is mostly just to show that we could extract the thylakoid membrane. We could identify it three-dimensionally in the, the cell. Okay, so if you want to use these tools, it's fairly straightforward. You have to select about 10 tiles, and these are just little 64 by 64 2D tiles from the, the whole, you know, 4K by 4K by 1K tomogram, or 2K by 2K by 512 tomogram, whatever size you've got. The size of the regions that you pit, that you select, typically 64 by 64 is used. Technically, you could use a different size if you wanted to. Uh, you select about 10 of those tiles, and then you fully annotate them. Now, you have to make sure when you do this process that you fully annotate the tile, meaning if there are four microtubules in the, in the tile and you only annotate two of them, then when you're training the network, you're trying to train the network to discriminate between the two things you said were microtubules and the two things you said weren't microtubules, which actually were microtubules, and the network will just spew out gibberish. It won't, won't do anything useful. So when you do this hand annotation, you have to do it very precisely. So you find about 10 tiles that have whatever the feature of interest is and you annotate them fully. And then you find another 100 tiles that don't have the feature of interest at all. And those you don't have to annotate because they're, you know, they don't have the feature. Um, and uh, then you train the network. Uh, if you use the GPU, 
It takes about three minutes. If you don't use a GPU, it may take about a half an hour, something like that, on a typical workstation. Uh, you then can apply all of the networks to each tomogram. This is currently done on the CPU, not on the GPU. Uh, it takes about one hour for each of the networks to be processed. Uh, we're working on a, a GPU version, but due to memory limitations, it takes uh, takes some some tweaking to make it work. Uh, and this is already you know, reasonably decent performance. And then at the very end, once you've applied all of the networks that you trained to each of the tomograms, uh, you, you then do the competitive merging process. Okay. I want to also raise this concept of, of autoencoders. Oops, sorry. Um, this is a very commonly invoked process right now in neural networks. Um, when you do single particle analysis, uh, one of the, you know, when you're doing it, particularly in the early stages when you're doing this 2D class averaging, one of the common things that you do is so called principal component analysis, where you take a set of particles and you try to pull out. Uh, common features among the particles to, to classify the particles and then produce these 2D class averages. Basically, you're looking for a reduced representation where you take, uh, the, take each particle and you can represent that particle by a small number of variables. So the idea of an autoencoder is basically a one-to-one -one analog for principal component analysis, and you can use it as a substitute for principal component analysis in, in, in a number of uh, different ways. The idea is you have an input layer uh, and then you have a gradually decreasing number of neurons in each subsequent layer uh, until you get to this sort of contraction point in the middle, which has the minimal number of neurons. And then you gradually expand again in sort of a mirror to what you did on the input side. When you train an autoencoder, the reason it's called an autoencoder is you don't have to come up with any training data. You basically put the same thing in the input as you do uh, as you have on the output. So you basically put in your noisy particles as both input and output to the network. And then the goal of the network is to represent all of the different particles that you're presenting it when you're training it uh, using these small number of variables. And then the, the, the other information is all embedded in the coefficients for these intermediate layers of the network. Once you've trained the network, you can then get rid of this part of the network and you can just put the input on this side of the network and then your reduced representation will come out here. Now, why would you do that? Why don't you just do principal and component analysis? The key here is that this is a nonlinear network. So it can do all sorts of interesting sorts of things and have interesting behaviors that, that a traditional linear system that is what you're doing when you do PCA can't achieve. Uh, so we've begun using autoencoders as well as a technique for, uh, for, for doing some of these reduced representations. Uh, this mechanism is used by another group who's uh, doing uh, uh, deep learning based cryotomogram segmentation. Uh, here's another refer a reference to the paper up here. Uh, and their goal, uh, unlike our case where we're trying to uh, have a human identify specific features and then uh, find all of those features, in this case, their goal is to actually do sort of de novo tomogram analysis uh, where you, uh, where, where you uh, uh, use one of these autoencoders to train uh, the, the network on basically all of the little regions in the tomogram, then it will find features for you and say, uh, here's a feature, here's a feature, here's a feature, and annotate them, uh, and then leave the human, leave it up to the, uh, up to the human to interpret the results. Okay, now the same method I just showed with, uh, showed for tomogram segmentation can be slightly adapted and used for particle picking. Now, probably saying, oh, why another particle picker? I mean, people have been developing particle pickers for the last 30 years. Everyone who comes into the field develops new particle pickers. Already had a halfway decent one in Eman. Why are you reinventing the wheel here? Well, one of the issues with particle picking, of course, is that no one can ever agree on the answers. So about 15 years ago, Bridget Carragher held one of these uh, particle picking uh, workshops where different people competed their algorithms against one another to do particle picking and see if you could come up with the best results. One of the interesting conclusions of that workshop was that even two or three different humans couldn't agree on what the correct answer was in a uniform way. Uh, to the extent that if you had one human do the particle picking on a micrograph and another human do the particle picking on the micrograph and then they compared the results, I'm not just saying the results are different, I'm saying that, that if the humans then argued about it, they couldn't come to uniform agreement over what should or shouldn't be included. Um, so neural networks do a pretty good job at mimicking humans, 
uh, since humans are in the end sort of the gold standard for particle picking still, why not do the same sort of thing that we did with the tomogram segmentation? So this is the, the, the network that we're using for, uh, for particle picking. It's a similar sort of convolutional network to what we did before. The only thing that's really changed is, the, is the, the training process and then the number of neurons that we have in here and that sort of thing. So uh, if we look back at segmentation again, we, uh, you know, tomogram segmentation, we boxed out these regions of the, of the, of the tomogram uh, and we annotated some feature. Again, here's the microtubules. Uh, there were no microtubules here, so we didn't annotate anything there. And then we train the network, and this is the trained output of the network. Okay, so after it goes through the network, you can see it can now recognize the microtubules pretty well, and it doesn't recognize microtubules in other places where there aren't microtubules. Now, in the case of particle picking, we don't care about whether there's something here or here or here or here. We're really just asking, is there a particle well-centered in this box? So the training set here doesn't require any annotation. It just requires particle picking. So you manually go in and say, oh, that's a particle, that's a particle, that's a particle, that's a particle. And then you train it against a Gaussian centered in the middle of the box. So if there's no particle presence, you box out a bunch of things that aren't particles and you and uh, say these aren't particles and then that'll have a, a zero box. And you bunch, box out a bunch of things that are particles and you say there is a particle here and it puts one of these Gaussian blobs in the middle of the box and then you train the network. Okay, so here's an example. So this was a, an example of, uh, uh, let's see, this was IP3 receptor, okay? So IP3 receptor was a very difficult data set to, to box automatically. Uh, and indeed, this entire data set of, I think there were 4,000 micrographs or something like that, were all boxed by hand, about 200,000 particles. And the reason was, if you use an automatic particle picker, it just didn't do a good enough job. So this is one of the better automatic particle picking uh, schemes, which is a reference-based scheme, where you have, have a low-resolution uh, map, you make projections and all orientations of the map, and then you use those to box out particles, to find the particles in the image. The problem is, with a typical threshold, you find a lot of false positives. If you raise the threshold, then you'll tend to miss certain views of the particle. So it's very difficult, for, you know, if you have something like a virus particle, it works fine. If you have something, uh, it's very high contrast and very well isolated will probably also work fine. But in cases like this, where sometimes you have these close together particles, you have very different appearances and different views, the reference-based picker just doesn't do a good job. Now, this was an example of using a reference-based picker with 20 hand-picked particles used as references. So they weren't very good references. However, if we do the same thing and we use references which were paired in the way I said a second ago using projections of a 3D map, we still have a lot of problems with false positives. If we use the neural network picker and we use the same 20 reference particles that were used for the, for the reference based picker previously as input, you can see we do actually a very nice job of boxing out the particles. If we compare that to what a human does, we overlap, so the blue now are, are the human pick particles, the red are the uh, neural network based pick part, uh, neural network pick particles, and you can see that there's almost a one for one match. There are a few places uh, where there are things that the neural network missed, and there are a few things where there are uh, things that, that the human mix, missed, but overall it's an acceptable result. Um, this took about 37 seconds to train the network, and uh, auto automatically picking each 4K by 4K image uh, takes about 10 seconds per CPU. So if you have a whole bunch of CPUs on your workstation, uh, it doesn't take very long to pick large numbers of micrographs. Uh, now, there are still some problems with this. One of the big problems is with contamination, ice contamination. So this is another example. This is beta galactosidase. This is a fairly low contrast image. We've trained a neural network and auto picked. And using this particular threshold, you can see while we do pull out a number of particles, it's missing a lot of particles, and it's boxing out a lot of this ice contamination region. Now, there's a difficulty, which is training one network to discriminate between background and particles, and to discriminate between, uh, between particles and contamination is difficult. Uh, it's difficult to get one network to accommodate both things, sort of training the same thing in two different directions. That also goes for aggregation. So if we have large aggregates that are present, uh, you also tend to have a lot of problems with those. So we've now made sort of a second stage uh, uh, strategy for, for doing automatic particle picking. So in, when we had the 2.2 release, 
we had the, the automatic particle picking, which worked pretty well, but it still had some of these problems with the contamination and that sort of thing. This uh, current nightly snapshots have a new version of the picker, which has a new category. So now instead of just picking two sets of references, we're picking three sets of references. We pick good particles. Most, they should generally be isolated particles. Um, then we pick regions of empty ice where there's, you know, there's nothing in the, in the background at all. And then in a third category, we pick out things which represent ice contamination or, or areas of aggregation or anything else which isn't a particle present in the images. And basically you need to pick about 10 or 15 examples in each area. And then we train two neural networks instead of one uh, to discriminate the different categories. So here's the areas of background, here's areas of bad things that aren't particles, and then here's some good particles. Uh, we train the network, and now you can see we can do a pretty good job of avoiding the contamination. It's not perfect. There's a little contamination here where it found a particle which was sitting on top of the contamination, and it, and it decided to include it rather than exclude it. But you can see it excluded this whole area, and now it's finding pretty much all of the particles pretty accurately. So this is now available in current versions of VBAN2, and it works very nicely. Um, actually, this is a duplicate slide. I had been showing it at the end before. OK, so uh, we're pretty much at the end now. Uh, just a warning here, uh, if you're using EMAN 2.2 uh, or the, one of the current snapshots, we use Theano for all of the neural network stuff. Uh, and Theano has the capability of doing neural network, uh, sorry, doing, uh, doing GPU acceleration uh, and it's a lot slower if you use the CPU over the GPU, like 20 or 30 times slower. Uh, and, but after you just install EMAN 2.2, you won't get that CUDA capability immediately. There's an extra set of instructions that you have to go through if you want to uh, uh, gain this uh, GPU support. Uh, we're doing a bunch of other things with these neural networks, which I'm not going to talk about today. We're using you know, a Gaussian mixture model with an autoencoder for 3D dynamics. Uh, I mentioned missing wedge, automatic missing wedge compensation. Uh, we have a mechanism using neural networks where we do missing wedge compensation for subtomogram classification, uh, which is a difficult problem uh, without neural networks. Uh, we have a strategy for doing dimensional reduction, manifold generation, for doing flexibility analysis. So we're doing a variety of different things now with, with, with these neural networks. Uh, and I think that's about it. So I can now take any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, so questions, uh, you can send them to me by chat. There, if you look in the bottom right corner of your window, there is a three dots with a menu. You can raise your flag, and if you're uh, if you're on a workstation or a laptop that's mic'd, I can unmute you. You can ask your question yourself. Um, uh, and anyone here in the room who wants to ask a question? Uh, all right. So we've got Zhang Li here. So. Uh, so will you? The, the particle picked with this way, so do you have someone like the list all the picked particles at the score of the some way like a bad particle go first? That's a less bad particle go last, so you can have the easy way to get rid of it. Yeah, yes, when the particles are selected by the algorithm, they get sorted in order of, of probability, basically, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. And there's there's a score that's that's saved as well. So I, I have uh, a couple. So um, uh, I know that uh, the recent versions of Eman 2, the 2.2, are much, uh, much faster than earlier ones, and they tend to be faster when built with uh, newer compilers or optimizations. Have you, um, have you built them for newer CPUs, like the uh, sort of newer Intel ones? And and how far do you typically optimize to, when you compile to get the most performance out? So the um the version that we dis the binaries that we distribute now uh, have a higher level of optimization than the binaries we previously distributed. So previously we were distributing for pro uh, distributing a binary that would work on processors as old as like 2005 or something like that. Uh, we've now upped the processor version, so we won't support anything older. The binaries now won't support anything older than you know like 2010 or 2011 or something like that. So it's using a lot of the newer uh, new newer opcodes available to do CPUs. Um, when we compile ourselves, I mean, when you compile for your own workstation or whatever, uh, we usually use the uh, O machine, you know, the, the machine optimization where it looks at the particular CPU that you have on that exact computer uh, and it optimizes uh, using the available opcodes op codes on that machine. Uh, I mean, we're basically just using the compiler optimization where, you know, we haven't hand optimized any of the code other than algorithm optimizations that would 
you know, be generally, uh, generally widely applicable. I mean, so we're not doing anything like FFTW where we're hand coding machine code or anything like that. Uh, you have to be a real specialist to do that kind of thing nowadays. Uh, you know, we've done some testing on uh, various uh, new processors that are, that are out there now. Uh, the FIs, the Intel FIs, uh, haven't performed all that well in our testing. I mean, they perform okay, but basically if you get one Phi and it's, you know, 60-something cores, uh, it will, or 70-something cores, it will, uh, it will perform about the same as one Xeon chip uh, of a similar, at a similar price range. Um, it's, so it's about equivalent performance on a chip per chip basis to, uh, to, to, to the normal Xeon processors. Uh, we've played with some of the new AMD processors as well, and they're actually, they've actually come back now. I would say uh, the AMD processors aren't better than the Intel processors, but they're pretty much equivalent on a clock for clock basis now. Did that answer the question? Yeah, that, yeah, that's good. I, um, I don't think that uh, people have really moved on past the sort of Intel Broadwells, like generally, but I think people are sort of, you know, treading into that water a little more carefully, particularly since the new Intel chips are super expensive. But the, uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they they certainly are. Uh, well, we continue to play around with these things, and uh, uh, you know, of course, we're we're getting into C into uh, GPUs again a little bit more. You know, we'd done GPUs back in the mid 2000s, and then we did them again like three years later. Uh, you know, around 2010, I guess, was the last time we did it. Uh, so uh, we've we've been getting back into that water again, but I'm trying to do it a little differently this time. The last time we tried to sort of put GPU code everywhere throughout Eman, uh, and it was just a a nightmare to maintain and it, it, the performance improvement just wasn't good enough and stuff. So now we're aiming much more at, at sort of specialized programs which are which are, 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 are targeting the GPU rather than trying to just make everything GPU enabled. Are you sticking mostly with uh, CUDA or are you going for sort of uh, We've been open CL a little, a little bit, but I think CUDA is pretty much the way, way we're, we're, we're going to go. I mean, I, I, OpenCL just isn't broadly enough available still at, at this point. If we're using uh, third-party libraries, so uh, we're switching now from using Theano for deep learning. Theano is being is is at end of life. They're going to do a 1.0 release, and then they don't intend to continue with it anymore. So we're switching to a uh, uh, Google's uh, platform for uh, uh, for for deep learning uh, in the future, and that does have some OpenCL support in addition to uh, uh, CUDA support. Uh, so I, that would be nice because, for example, then on Mac laptops, you would be able to uh, do some of the training using the AMD GPUs they use. Uh, but uh, in terms of sort of broader programs, I think we'll probably stick with Google. Yeah, and you know, hopefully Macs will have external GPUs or some sort of thing. Yeah, coming. I mean, they're moving back in that direction again now. I think they, I think they promised in the keynote this summer that you know next spring they would they would be having a, a solution along those lines. Great. All right. Anyone else? Any other questions by chat? All right. Steve, thank you very much. That was uh, really great. Great to see what's coming in Eman 2. All the other uh, people out there, if you're using, if you want to check out the Theano uh, GPU uh, particle picking, uh, it should be working in the SP Grid versions. If you see any issues, you have any bugs, feel free to drop me an email. Uh, and with that, thank you very much for joining. Take care. All right. Bye.